Hey, game makers! We're doing yet, yet another 10 more epic tips and tricks. This is number four in an ongoing series, and the previous ones will be linked in the description. As usual, this list will contain helpful tips, cool things, annoying things, stuff, and general game making advice. MV recently updated to version 1.1. You know what that means? Lots and lots of plugin updates! I know what that means? Time to go get a muffin ton of plugin updates to be compatible with version 1.1. As weird things might occur, that will probably cause errors and evil evil crashy. I can't stress this enough, back up all of your current plugins before you do this. Backups are your friends. If you're ever updating anything ever, make a backup first. Another new thing to the MV update was a change to deployment. You can check this box here to have it remove excess files your game doesn't use from the deployed copies folder. Which is great, but it's not perfect. The deployer... Are we calling it that now? The deployer doesn't take things like preloaded plugins or plugins that call files based on script calls or no tags into account. So, say you're using the ultimate overlay plugin. Since that calls all of the parallax images via no tags and script calls, they don't get added into the mix. Now, this isn't too bad. As if you're at the point where you're using this to remove files, it's clearly because you have a lot of excess files. So it's not that difficult to just copy the extra files you need and put them into the folders manually. Character graphics, overworld sprites, or whatever you want to call them. If you put a dollar sign in front of their name, this will make the graphic appear as only one character set instead of the normal eight. Using an exclamation mark will remove the default sprite offset by the way, by default, MV pushes character sprites up 4 pixels. And the exclamation mark will also remove bush tags from working on them. The exclamation marks can also be used on parallaxes. In this case, it will move the parallax background along with the player, as opposed to where it normally sticks to the screen statically. Fun fact! When using selector windows in MV, the files show ordered by number, capital alphabetically, lowercase alphabetically, special characters, so the ones that start with exclamations, and then dollar signs, and lastly, that maps tile sets, excluding auto tiles. MV Enemy Graphics. It's got a folder for SV Enemy Graphics, and a folder for Front View Enemy Graphics. The selector will only show the set of graphics in that specific battle system you have selected. So, if you have Side View checked off under System, it will only show you the Side View folder. Having that not checked will show you the Front View Graphics. So if you're using the side view battle layout, you'll need to put your monster graphics under SV underscore enemy, not enemies. In most cases, anything you want to event, a plugin can do easier. Don't get me wrong, I love eventing things. It's a form of programming even someone with very little programming knowledge can use easily. I frequently have people ask me how to event something complicated because they don't want to use a plugin. Plugins are there to be used. And now more than ever, since so many of them can be used commercially. Now, if you want to spend hours trying to event something super simple that eventing makes super tedious, that's fine, I've done it. Eventing also gives those less familiar with scripting the freedom to create their own things, and much more freedom to modify and edit them. Like eventing your own minimap instead of using one of the dozen minimap plugins out there. In the end, it depends on what you're trying to event, or what you'd need a plugin for. But I gotta say, nothing's quite the same kind of sad as spending hours trying to event the living daylights out of something, and having a programmer come up to you and be like, that's super simple, I'll write a code, it'll take five minutes. But holy muffins, is it ever satisfying when your evented monstrosity actually works? Common events are your friends. You can use them as a means to place commonly used bunches of events and commands, so you don't have to keep re-entering the same things all the time. Or use them as literal game processes. You can use common events to trigger things after battles, a custom commonly used in event, a massive list of commonly used codes, calling events from items, common events within common events to call other common events, rememorizing variables, removing the entire party, save points, doing battle stuff, mass world based conditional branching, and much more. Graphics are and aren't important. I'd say a major stigma with RM games is everyone uses default everything and throws their games on Steam. Now, this just leaves a bad taste in everyone's mouth, because that's all anyone ever sees come out of RPG makers. Now, RM stock graphics are fine, MVs in particular have a very colorful style to them, but if you're going out of your way to try and sell your game, at least give it the decency of going online and finding better graphics. And I want to make this very clear. 
You do not need to make your own graphics to make a good game. You do not need the greatest looking graphics to make a good game. But if you want your game to feel like its own game and not just another default RM clone, what it needs is its own style, graphically or otherwise. Whether this style is a mishmash of pretty looking tile sets from Google, or kind of okay not so detailed pixel art. If your game is strong in other areas, as long as the graphics fit the theme and tone of your game, they don't need to be the OMG best graphics ever! Google, search, be free! Okay, let's talk balancing. Statting monsters, statting skills, statting weapons, all that stuff is a total little pain in the butt. I have the greatest respect for anyone who thinks statting stuff is fun. Let's consider statting monsters, equipment, and how they affect the difficulty curve of our game. There are a lot of factors at play. What equipment is available, what kind of items we have, how frequent the monsters are, how much XP they give us, how many areas there are, the list goes on. Now, there may be an entire system or formula for dealing with statting monsters, and there are a few plugins out there that make it easier, but the best advice I can give you is work with it as you go and don't commit to anything. Between the start and the end of your project, you'll be adding things, taking things out, changing your mind, and that's all before you've even gotten someone to test play it. And trust me, you won't realize how bad your game's balancing actually is until you watch someone else suffer through it. Two story, once I got the great idea to have five monkeys attack a single actor with mass status spells, including, but not limited to, slow, poison, silent, sleep, and paralyze. Now, that was a very long time ago, and at that time, I didn't really think about it. I didn't bother to test it, and it was just all cool monster status, yay! This, this was not a good idea, so I changed that right away. My best advice on this matter is honestly work out statting and balancing as you go. And when you finish and replay it, work out statting some more. And get someone else to play it and work out statting some more. Things change, and so does where your player will be mechanically at that specific point. So from my experience, just spend time adjusting and refining things as you go. Don't fall into this trap. There's a circle of evil I find people fall into. And I've seen this firsthand a lot of times. You start off strong. You've got a good first chunk of the game done. Everything looks fine. And then you want to change things. So you go back. You add things. You modify things. Then you want it to look a little different. So you change out all of your graphics. And then you realize you can do the things you did at the start so much better now. So you go back and redo them. But now your ideas are all different. So you want to change what you originally had to fit your new ideas. And at this point, you can't keep up with it. So you take a break, and then decide to just start a new project completely with your slightly better idea. I beg you, do not fall into this trap. I've seen this time and time again. It's fine to change things, and it's fine to make things better. But you're naturally going to learn things and get better as you go. So by the end of it, yeah, you would be able to make the game better than when you started but you're never gonna finish it if you can't stick to it. By the time you go back and change everything, where's the project you started? What progress have you really made? It's a completely different game at that point. What I'm trying to say is pick an idea and stick to it. You can refine it as you go and change it, but stick to it and let it grow with you, not keep getting reset for the new you. If you can't, scrap it until you find one you'd rather do and stick to that. Know your audience. Know who you're making the game for. Know the kind of people who will be playing your game. Are you making the game for you? Then make it in the way a game would make you happy. A game you'd have fun playing. Are you making it as a gift for someone? Think about what they'd like to play, or the kinds of stories and mechanics they're interested in. Want to make a game anyone can play? Be considerate of intense swearing or inappropriate content. You don't want to cut those people out of your potential fan base. Want to make a gory horror game, or a game in a specific style or genre? That's fine, and that's great, you should. But just know that not everyone will want to play it, and that's perfectly fine. My first game was made for my brother. Its content was geared exclusively towards him. Second game? It was made for me. It had what I wanted to play at the time. The game was made for me to enjoy, and enjoy it I do. If you're making a game for yourself, make it the game you want to play. Do what makes you happy, and make a game you'll have fun playing. If you're making a game that you intend to have others play, you should still do what you like, and what you enjoy playing. But keep in mind those who will be playing your game, and how they'll experience it too. 
And that's all for the fourth installment of our Tips and Tricks series. If you'd like to support future tutorials, Tips and Tricks videos, and other random ERPG stuff, you are welcome to check out my Patreon page. Special thanks to Damien Floyd for supporting what we do here. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time, gamers! Yeah.